Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lug Doll Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com. Photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing Wonder Woman 1984. Wonder Woman 1984 is an American 2020 superhero film based on the DC Comics Wonder Woman. It is the sequel to the 2017's Wonder Woman and the ninth installment in the DC Extended Universe, also known as the DCEU. The film was directed by Patty Jenkins from a script she wrote with uh, Jeff Johns and David Callingham. Jeff Johns, big, uh, big DC comic book guy, screenwriter. Um, he's been, you know, he's done work all from uh, the CW series from Justice League 2017, unfortunately Greenlander 2011, Aquaman 2018, a little bit of Smallville era, also Titans as well, we've covered them. It's also written by David Callahan and Patty Jenkins. Patty Jenkins was the main director, or she was the director on the first um, Wonder Woman as well. Had a lot of uh, wonderful things to say about the first Wonder Woman. I don't believe we've actually reviewed it yet, but if we do go back and do it, get enough good reception on this podcast, then we might have to go back and talk about uh, the original pod, uh, the original Wonder Woman. So, um, yeah, it's based on a story by Johns and Jenkins, um, Patty Jenkins and Jeff Johns. Gal Gadot stars again as Wonder Woman, uh, Diana Prince alongside Chris Pine. I guess this is kind of getting into the uh, trailer spoilers, so if you haven't seen the trailer, then, you know, kind of watch out. This is where we're talking about the stuff in the trailer, and this is the plot and stuff like that. So, set in uh, 1984, during the Cold War, the film follows Diana and her past love, Steve Trevor, as they face off against Maxwell Lord and Cheetah. So I did a little bit of uh, research, and I have found out this is on a budget of $200 million. Uh, once again, I believe the first one was made between 120 and 150 The thing is, I you know, with most sequels, I expect it to look better. I expect it to be a slightly, just a little bit more... Uh, focused of a movie, a little bit more confident in what's going on. And yes, I do think there's a confidence there behind the director, Patty Jenkins, of what she has with Gal Gadot. I think she's comfortable shooting Gal Gadot. She's a very aesthetically pleasing person to look at. But what's going on with nineteen uh, Wonder Woman 1984? Well, it is a slightly different uh, writing team. If you go back and look, it's uh, uh, slightly different from the original Wonder Woman um, movie in 2017. But past that, you know, we have Hans Zimmer. We have, uh, I think, Matt, Matthew Jensen. Was he the uh, cinematographer as well? On uh, Matthew, 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 Matthew. Yep, he was the original one um, too. And so, with saying all that, I have a list a concise list of uh, what's going on with this movie. So, um, as I'm saying, I'm trying to pull it up. <laughs> All right, sorry. All right. Uh, here we go. The pros of 19... Uh, I keep saying uh, Wonder Woman 1984. The first half of the movie was stronger for the villains. Second half let them down. They're endearing up to a point with good actors, unfortunately followed up with bad dialogue. This movie is what I would call tonally inconsistent. The first half feels completely different from the second half. It's a two and a half hour movie, and sometimes I feel like I'm watching a 1990s uh, adventure comedy, or romantic comedy, versus a modern day tale about um you know greed and so i'm trying to like balance it out 
but it really felt like Wonder Woman is uh, sprinkled into the world of like the uncut gems idea. Now, if anyone doesn't know what uncut gems is, it's a kind of like the monkey paw. It's the uh, the idea that you know you make a wish and you have the wish come true, but with that coming true, you're going to sacrifice something big for it. Normally, that sacrifice is not worth whatever you know uh, you want to come true. The cons of the movie, like I said earlier, the writing is all over the place. It's tonally inconsistent. The pacing is much more consistent with an older, I'd say like an older Superman movie. I'm hearing uh, Superman 2 or, th 2 or 3. I don't remember which one because it's been a long time since I've seen that, but that's what it kind of feels like. More of a... the In comparison to the first movie, the first movie was like an adventure film. It was a... a, a uh, a journey of self-discovery and this movie is trying to be kind of a little bit more self-reflective but also have like a detective side story as well and it's just not nearly as compelling as the first one um with saying that the pacing the pacing was much more consistent with uh um just an older film and so having that older pacing feel it also has this campiness to it which in comparison to the first one so let me just talk about it it's uh it feels completely totally different from the first one the first one felt like uh it had unfortunately i'm i'm not gonna say unfortunately i do think that there are positive aspects of Zack snyder's influence the action in his movie is generally pretty uh pulse pounding um you know, give or take some of the Man of Steel stuff, I feel like I, I can generally feel the hits. I mean, when you in 300 and Immortals, I really felt like Henry Cavill was hitting these people. Gerard Butler was hitting these guys. And when we watched Patty Jenkins shoot the first Wonder Woman in 2017, I felt like Wonder Woman was beating the hell out of these people. And so... um you know, and blocking the bullets really, you know, really effectively and stuff like that. And it, it was really excellently choreographed. I've always been um, uh, apt for saying that. And so I feel like there is no, um, I don't want to say Zack Snyder-ness, but I don't even, let's put that to the side. But there's no gravity to the action of this movie. The action in this movie felt like everyone's bouncing all over the place even when bad guys are getting kicked around the place, it really looked like they're just getting picked up and thrown and they bounce. And it just feels like there's no weight to what's happening. And so the action in this just did not, uh, I don't know, it did not really impact me in a way that felt like uh, it was anything different than what we saw in the first movie. And of course, it's uh, it's really difficult not to compare to the first movie. It's like, that's your first act. The first two and a half hours of this character were amazing. And we've seen her in other movies as well. Justice League, we've seen her sprinkled in... Um, uh, what other movie? Uh, all the DC Extended Universe movies that she's been in. I, I can't think of them off the top of my head. Um but uh, I'll let someone else do it. But the movies that she's been, um, uh, she's been in, she's done an excellent job. She's carried the action in what she's done. This was the most unimpressive action I've seen, unfortunately, from Wonder Woman. So, continuing on, uh, the story will vary by individual. Like I said, it's sort of like an uncut gems on a global scale without going into too much uh, spoiler territory or uh, like a uh, like a monkey paw um, territory. Um, or sorry, monkey paw territory. Monkey, it's like monkey paw on a global scale, but that's all I want to say without going into spoilers. And um, yeah, let me see anything else that we have. Um... So yeah, that that's about all I've got right here. And 
I will say I did hear critical reception going into this movie. I, I don't want to say that I was completely um, blind going in. I had heard that it was just an okay movie and it wasn't as good as the first one. And I really liked the first one. I the, That's the thing is I liked the music. I liked the characters. I liked the world that they set up. I, I really enjoyed how they have uh, Themycria, I think. It's the the world of the Amazons um, that they're in. And it's just like, it felt like a very lived in world. This feels like something that studio produced, unfortunately. So, um, let's hop into spoilers. And remember, normally we would have spoilers for the Patreon members, but, uh, you know, it's Christmas time. We're giving back. It's, uh, Hanukkah time, it's Kwanzaa time. I think that we're actually releasing this on Kwanzaa, so be sure to tell everybody happy Kwanzaa. And happy new year. Let's uh try to, you know, end this year on somewhat of a positive note if we can. Um but yeah. And again, these are all my opinions. These are, you know, strictly opinions. Don't, you know, don't go don't get upset about them. Let me know what you thought about the movie. And, um, yeah, let me know how I, I can improve. I know I was a little bit uh, jabber-jogged to, this morning. I actually woke up really early to finish this movie. Watched the first 30 minutes last night, and I just passed out. I was just like, this is a long-ass movie, and I'm not going to make it. So I definitely think it was the um, the smart move to do that because uh, I needed a cup of coffee for this. It, you know, the, the, It's a long one, I'm not going to lie. It did, and it, I don't feel like it breezed by like um, the first one did, unfortunately. So, let's hop into spoilers for Wonder Woman 1984. And remember, you can get the full podcasts are normally posted in Patreon. Um, dot com slash Look It All Podcast. Full podcast mastered is also on SoundCloud. There are um, uh, YouTube, Twitch, all the social medias. You already know what to do. Check them out in the description. That's how you can support. Follow, subscribe. Do all that good shit, you know. All right, let's uh, let's look at this shit. Let's look at this shit. Let's look at this shit. <laughs> Had to do a little dance to that. You know. All right, so one thing I want to check is to see if this... Um, is the same editor, Richard Jenkins, I think is this one. Okay, Martin Walsh is the editor in the first Wonder Woman 2017 film. This one, uh, the 1984 movie, Wonder Woman 1984, is edited by Richard Pearson. I'm trying to figure out what he's done that was... Oh, he's done a fuck ton of things. He's done, you know... Uh, damn men in black muffins of space iron man 2 okay hold on hold on hold on hold on Re rewind hold on computer enhance oh my lanta this might we might have found something everyone okay so so he does have a mixed record on editing and this might also have gone to how long this movie was i really i really thought 20 minutes easily could have been cut of this movie. Now, Men in Black 2, eh. Rundown was fun. Born Supremacy, okay. See, when it gets a little bit funky is around Get Smart, you know, mixed reception on that. I kind of had a fun time. Quantum of Solace, it's like, eek. That's where the editing might get a little funk. Iron Man 2, right after Quantum of, Sol uh, Quantum of Solace, it's like, yikes. And wasn't Red Dawn one of the worst movies of 2012? I, I can't remember exactly if that was... Was that? I think that was pretty critically reviled. And he did Justice League. Oh my goodness. And Godzilla King of Monsters. Oh my... This... Dude, this guy... Okay, so... I'm sorry. This guy does not have a great track record with... Uh, really great films. Although I did... I don't know. Kung Skull Island, I guess. Mileage might vary. 
So I will say that this editor is not one of my favorites, just a heads up, which is why it might just linger a little bit longer than most. Or he just not, might not be an editor that people really like. He, he might just have a different flavor. He, he, he feels like an editor that wants to linger on the shots like a little bit longer than he needed to. And um, because there weren't, weren't any really impressive shots like one takes – it makes the editing stand out a little bit more alongside how choppy the, the, the script is. So here's the plot. As a young girl, Diana Prince participates in a multi-stage athletic competition at the Micria. Sorry if I'm not saying that right. Against the Amazons. Older Amazons. After falling from her horse and taking a shortcut, she is disqualified. Diane's mother, Queen Hippolyta, or Hippolyta, I don't know, <laughs> and her aunt, Antelope, lecture her on the importance of truth, because no hero is born from lies. So, mixed feelings on the opening Amazon's um, little American ninja warrior Wonder Woman warrior shit they got going on. I was just like, okay, okay, we see some um, training montage. We wanted to get Robin right back. Nothing wrong with that. She's like one of my number one crushes in Hollywood. Um, and uh, oh, you hear my stomach growling. Um, I think I'm hungry for some Robin Wright. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but uh, the thing is. This opening scene had some pretty horrendous CGI, in my opinion. Now, I don't know if it was my television. I could just, you know, I might need to look at it on a different screen. But I don't feel like this was a very substantial um, opening or substantive opening in comparison to the first time we saw them. In the first movie, it's it's going to be impossible not to talk about the first movie. Um in comparison, because the first opening sequence in the first one was amazing. They had this big opening battle, jumping from their horses. It felt like um, like the epitome of when Game of Thrones had these big, massive battles, but it felt like with like Amazonians, and it was just like freaking badass, and people were doing these arrows, and it, it, was, it was like 300 with all these amazing fit individuals. It, fucking bad ass i could not have asked for a better opening in the first movie and this one it was like okay okay you know it's the the um they're not being attacked but they're um they're definitely training in a way that you know as if they're being attacked but i never felt like even in this movie they ever got to the point where they were having to attack like that like the action in this movie is just like so minuscule in comparison to the majority of action in DC at all. Um, the more I think about it, it just felt like people were being slung left and right, kind of not really being hurt that much. Maybe uh, collateral damage a little bit. Maybe some of the villains had some stuff, but to be honest, I felt like everyone was just uh, you know okay. It felt like this would have been okay for like Saturday morning television. So, um, let me pull up my quick notes right here as well, my, um, nerdy notes. I was not actually a big fan of the title se titles that came up. I felt like even as the titles were coming up, I was, uh, I know that they're, everyone's like, oh my goodness, you're going to go through the fucking titles now. You know, I, I enjoyed the WB titles. I enjoyed the, uh. DC titles, I always felt like that was going to mean it was going to be a badass movie. I actually enjoy the um, posters and the trailer styles a little bit more, and the music they had. It, it just felt like a fun, whimsical time, you know? And I would say this is a fun time, but it's too long to say it's whimsical. It's 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 too drawn out to say it's, uh, it, it's like that. And... Um, yeah, the, the aesthetic of the 80s, even through this entire movie, is just very, um, it's set dressing, to be honest. It's, there's real no reason except for, you know, maybe the Cold War kind of thing. Let me see. 
Okay, so yeah, the beginning feels like a Cirque du Soleil for Wonder Woman. Green screen, I thought looked horrible. When the crowd is cheering and Robin Wright and uh, um, Diane are talking in front of this screaming crowd, did anyone else feel like that looked just god-awful or was that just my, my television? I might need to go back and look on something else, but I was just, I was shocked. Kind of petrified. You know what it looked like? It looked like the color grain wasn't complete on that first one. And it it didn't look like that all the time, honestly. It, it felt like the color grain just didn't match the real world from the Amazonian world. Um, and I, I noticed the effects felt very floaty from, uh, you know, right off the jump. Um, okay, so... In 1984, decade, decades after World War I, Diane works as a senior anthro anthropologist as, uh, at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. That's a big, that's a fucking mouthful. Um, specializing in the culture of ancient Mediterranean civilizations. Diane continues to fight crime as Wonder Woman um, while maintaining a uh, Animity. At work, she meets Barbara and Minerva, an insecure woman who idolizes and envies Diane, Diana for her beauty and confidence and befriends her. So, I thought Barbara was gay when we first uh, were looking at this first couple scenes. I was like, oh, so she totally is like into Barbara. And I will say... The setups are a little slow of these villains, but they're somewhat endearing. You understand kind of the uh, the come up a little bit. There is like a third act sequence for what happens with Pedro Pascal. Um, and it's like a flashback. And I really felt like this would have been served at the beginning. So we would have felt a little bit more um, endeared to him. Or at least maybe seen a little bit more before he turned into such a slime ball. After Wonder Woman foils an attempted robbery, the FBI asks Barbara to identify a cache of stolen antiquities from uh, the robbery. One item both women take notice of as an, an inscription in Latin. Businessman Maxwell Lord visits the Smithsonian under the guise of making a donation. Um, secretly, he covets the Dreamstone hoping to save his unfailing, sorry, hoping to fail his uh, failing oil company. Um, both Diane and Barbara know, unknowingly use the stone to fulfill their own desires. Diane wishes for her deceased lover, Steve Trevor, to return, who is played by Chris Pine, causing his soul to take over another man's body. And Barbara wishes to become strong and beautiful like Diane. Diana. Um, during a gala night at the Smithsonian, she meets Maxwell, who seduces her in order to gain access to her office so he can take the Dreamstone. He wishes to become the embodiment of the stone and gains its power to grant wishes, while also uh, able to take whatever he desires in return. And so, this is just the MacGuffin. This is the stone. This is the uncut gem stone. I don't think it's a spoiler to say in uncut gems you have the stone as well, and it's the stone of desires, and somehow it can make things happen. I think, you know, the stone just, the stone knows all. And so the stone makes uh, wishes, uh, grants the wishes of, you know, whatever people wish. And so I think that's, an okay concept it's not a great concept for a sequel but you know it's like okay i um you know all right movie world you're suspending my disbelief a little bit more you know I was, the floaty stuff was a little little bit much and then it just you know now this is a second thing i'm like okay i'm still with you movie don't don't completely shut me out yet and um uh i enjoy seeing you know the behind the scenes of maxwell lord's life you know Seeing, uh, you know, with the sun, all that type of stuff. 
uh, seeing the struggle. We're seeing the struggle on both sides. Although I really feel this is like an hour into the movie. So let me see. Kristen Wiig's character, yeah, like I said, um, I thought she was into Diane at first when they go on like this, like uh, you know, girl date kind of thing. And that that like opening dinner was not that endearing to each other. I just felt like, uh, you know, they had some awkward chemistry and, you know, one good time kind of thing. Or, you know, not one good time, but, you know, they had a, a good time as friends. And so, yeah. the I, I realized the first 15 minutes of the movie have not hooked me in. And uh, I'm I'm like, what is the issue? And so I'm I, I I wrote in my notes an hour into it, it feels like the writing is keeping this back. Most of what's interesting in this movie is not Wonder Woman, um, and what I'm seeing is kind of an expensive romantic comedy. There's not much about this first hour that is much of a Wonder Woman movie, with the exception of having the Wonder Woman aesthetic and world. Um, I know you're like, well, that's like everything, right? Well, not really. Um, it's like you can have a Wonder Woman world, but or you can have a Superman world, but uh, uh, it can be just Clark Kent in it, and he's not doing any super stuff. And that's what kind of feels like this movie. It's it's Wonder Woman for the first hour, just being a detective. Um, and you know, we've seen Batman kind of do this and do it a little bit more on on that tracking style, but she is kind of split divided in the focus of trying to be with Steve Trevor, who um, is not introduced yet, but it he becomes introduced and it kind of feels like it loses focus. Like I do feel like the first half hour would have really served of maybe 15 minutes of getting to know the, the villains a little bit more and then um, maybe a little bit more of a struggle of what Diane has been going through. Because it really doesn't feel like she's been struggling at all. The beginning of this is so... Um, uh, it feels like bubblegum. Like, like, I think I said it earlier, it felt like a 1990s um, romp kind of thing. It didn't feel like uh, an action film that I would be expecting in the DCEU universe. Especially following up... Uh, uh, how brutal Joker was and and just the, the broodingness of it. I know I'm not expecting the broodingness in this movie at all, but I'm just saying just some down-to-earth drama. I felt like I didn't have any of that in this movie, um, with the exception of a couple of scenes. I will say there was one or two scenes that I felt endeared to the villains in some scenes. I did, and maybe Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor in one couple scenes. But overall, I did feel like it felt... Um, you know, uh, not, it just felt like not that important kind of thing and, uh, and forgetful almost. Um, yeah, like I said, and kind of an expensive co romantic comedy. And uh, Barbara is somewhat uh, more interesting when she begins to use her power as an aggressor. When you see someone being bullied and they suddenly have this power and you're like, they're starting to use it for a little bit and they start to use it not for good things. It's it was cool to see her turn because originally people were like, fuck this bitch. It's like they were just completely saying this is the worst fucking person ever. And they they were literally ignoring her, kicking her while she's down, papers down. She was she was like, gosh, help. No, they like they're stepping on her while she like leaving the office building and shit like that. She was the cliche nineteen nineties nerd. And um yeah, I, I can't say much more than that. I feel like you kind of felt good for her at, at the beginning when she got her power back and she wasn't being harassed anymore. But then she started being really super harassed, but we'll, we'll get more into it. Um, so let's continue. Um, Maxwell becomes... Uh, uh, Maxwell becomes a powerful and influential figure as his body begins to slowly die while leaving chaos and destruction in his wake as he wishes as his wishes trigger instability and conflict. Um, Barbara, Diane, and Steve investigate uh, the Dreamstone's powers further and discover it was created by Diachelafria Eero. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I, the Duke of Deception. Uh, it's a, a DC comic character. The God of Treachery and Mischief. The 
stone creates uh sorry the stone grants a user their wish but extracts a toll the only way to reverse the exchange is by renouncing the wish or destroying the stone itself steve realizes that his existence comes at the cost of diane's power and that dude's body i just want to talk about they've just jacked that dude's body for this entire movie and uh well you know phrasing right not not literally that but you know they they hijacked this dude's body i think vulture did a a piece on it um this this piece is sorry to the man who is not chris pine and wonder woman 1984 imagine being the quote-unquote other chris pine it's like eh, we we need a chris pine look-alike but you know we'll put him back you know push him back you know it's like uh when he originally shows up i was like how is this possible how is he back is 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 it time reversal is it is he taking over this dude's body and it's quickly uh shown that um clearly diane is sleeping with this random man that she is only perceiving as steve trevor street steve trevor is basically still he's still dead and only uh in her mind i guess um but yeah i was just i, I might link this article to say the, the the vulture just like i was like what the fuck is going on with this like a body swap thing there's a lot of concepts in this movie that aren't always fully fleshed out or taken seriously and that's where the romantic comedy kind of comes in quote unquote, unquote comedy because it's like there's some problematic shit because um let me think about it like They've been probably sleeping together, and that guy has no idea that Steve Trevor's been <laughs> using that dude's body. Like, there is something going on. Like, what if Wonder Woman like <laughs> might have violated that dude? <laughs> Give him a little prostate exam. <laughs> oh my goodness! There, you know, if you really go down the rabbit hole, this, you know, something could be really problematic about that. Okay, so um, we're kind of getting in a little bit this into long, but, um, you know, I was just kind of thinking about that, you know, through the movie. It just kept coming up in my head in the back back of my mind. I was like, wait a second, this guy is not really there. <laughs> it's this other guy. So, <laughs> um, so, yeah, we find out basically Pedro Pascal is basically playing Trump. And when this was made, I actually found out this was made in six months. I could not believe this was, uh, sorry, not made, but it was shot in six months. But um, between uh, June, principal photography, June 13, 2018, and it wrapped on December 22nd, 2018. Six month shoot. That's, uh, it says a little bit additional filming in um, 2019. But I mean, overall, if they did all this in six months, that would kind of explain why it's just not as um as good of a movie because it just felt like they didn't put the time into it they didn't took the i don't feel like they had the time of uh in the script and what they really felt like they needed to have and so um yeah we do find out uh the wish is grant granting uh, it's a fun concept to see just random things happening they literally build a wall some some uh, hand fisted stuff happens in this movie. It's just like, all right, so he's Trump. He's building walls. He's he's greedy. Okay, we use uh, he was abused as a kid, kind of thing. No one loved him, you know that type of thing. To um, uh, yeah, the 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 wish granting is just random. Um, the camera angles inside uh, the car look like old school Hollywood. This is when uh. There is the the big fight between Wonder Woman and like the Middle East kind of uh, the desert and stuff like that. And I do kind of enjoy that old school Hollywood look. It, it looked stylistically like they were supposed to be doing that and that the green screen was not supposed to match it 100% with the lighting and everything. But um, I will say... Uh, there's just crazy things this fucking whip can do. All right, so the whip... Um, uh, it's the whip of, what is it? The lasso of truth. It's the lasso of do whatever the hell you needed to do at the time you need to do it. Um, wow. The, the lasso literally goes as far as you need, can grab whatever you need, whenever you need it. It can, um, it's essentially like Green Lantern's, um, ring, I guess. I, I just feel like the, the lasso literally has no bounds and... 
she used it like hell in this movie. I don't ever remember her. What, did did she lose her shield or something in the last couple movies? I don't remember if she had lost it or it had exploded or something um, in between the two. But I felt like she used the shield a lot more in the first one. She was a lot more like battle, battle and tech tactile when it came to um, like hands on combat type stuff. This was just. Use the whip, use the whip, use the whip. I was like, oh my god, this whip can do any, any fucking thing. The whip fucking caught a damn bullet that was going for Steve Trevor. Um, so it was like, all right, so literally it can catch anything. <laughs> and it did catch anything. There's a, there's a scene where she catches fucking lightning. Did that fucking happen in the old school Wonder Woman's? Like that, that was just like, whoa. So um, speaking of the old school Wonder Woman's, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um but yeah, I um, I like the interesting camera perspectives during this scene. But it, uh, Chris Pine getting out of the car. Um, there's a scene where the the car is uh, sorry, the camera is just sitting in the car, and he rams the um, the tank that's fighting Diana or something like that. Um, and I thought the camera was gonna continue with him as he crawled out of the car, and it cuts. I was like. Why did y'all cut? I felt like this was a prime opportunity to have the camera follow Steve Trevor, you know, onto this uh, this moving vehicle and stuff like that, and could have just gone for a really cool one -er, and they just decided not to. I felt like, uh, you know, it was it was a wasted opportunity, unfortunately, and um, there wasn't anything that impressive with any of the action in this movie unfortunately i felt like every set piece of action in the first movie was better than almost all of the set pieces in this except the hallway fight dc always finds a way to have some really amazing hallway fights and so i feel like this one had a pretty decent hallway fight too so um all right so what else do we have um yeah, the one or the one take would have been great but they decided not to chris pine launches uh, a missile and she uses the whip to propel herself off of the missile i after she propelled herself off the missile i was like what the f what is going on this is this is just next level I, is nobody going to question this uh, it's just like okay and um yeah so they find out about more of the uh uncut gem i, I will say I think his name's Ravi Patel is in this uh, as one of the Mayan guys. Don't remember his name in this, but um, that wig looked horrible. I just gotta say. <laughs> um, uh, let's see who else we got. Pedro's uh, Pedro Pascal's son is very endearing, um, or it's uh, it's not really his son. It's Maxwell Lord's son in the movie, but I, I'm just gonna say Pedro Pascal because you know it's always Pedro no matter what. Um, and uh, Pedro literally is breaking down like a robot. I mean, he is, um, he's playing it up to a, a point where I was like, okay, I'm really feeling it. Um, this character feels like a descent into madness. I, I, I enjoyed watching his descent, um, even though you, you just have to know he is campy. He's not, you can't take him 100% seriously. So, let me see. Okay, so the only way to reverse the exchange of the uh, stone is by renouncing the wish or destroying the stone itself. Steve realizes that his existence comes at the cost of Diane's power. Diana's power. Which I think is an interesting... Um, you know, kind of like problem to, to deal with. Both Diana and uh, Barbara are unwilling to renounce their wishes, so they f try to find alternative solutions. Um, and so Barbara has clear motive. Like, she did not enjoy life before what was going on, the confidence that had struck her, and literally the strength that has struck her. It's just like she has clear motive, but she just takes it to the nth degree I don't know if it makes sense why she becomes a cheetah lady. Um, 
kind of felt like a little bit like Catwoman in a way, but it's like, eh. I, I know different origin stories, but it's just like, eh. You know. I wonder if they've, I'm, maybe in the DC comics they've met up or something like that. I don't know. But uh, when she's in the full suit, I got a full on Cat's vibe. I was like, this is, this is no bueno. <laughs> So, um, see, uh, I did notice at this point, I didn't feel like there were any notable black characters. I felt like all of the black characters in this movie, unfortunately, were relegated to the side. I mean, granted, there is some decent diversity with having Pedro Pascal in there, but it was, uh, you know, other than that, it wasn't really that, um, that diverse of a movie. Um, maybe Pascal's son... Because he clearly wasn't... I it, His son didn't look like he was supposed to be his literal son. Like, not biological son. Maybe adopted son. Or his wife might have had some sort of uh, uh, different descent in him. In her. I don't know. I, I did feel like there was uh, a reasoning that they made the son... Uh, a different uh, ethnicity than Pedro. Um, let me see what else we got. Um, okay, yeah, the the only black characters I, I saw in this movie were in the street, unfortunately, when they were yelling about the, uh, you know, sa they were trying to save people and stuff like that. But it's just like y'all couldn't find anybody to have on the main, on the main roster. Um, so yeah, it was a moving scene when they do re, uh, renounce the wish. Um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Maxwell, upon learning from the President of the United States that the United States satellite broadcast can transmit signals globally, decides to use it to grant wishes to the entire world, inadvertently giving the United States more nuclear weapons, which threatens to start a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Um, Barbara joins forces with the with Maxwell to prevent Diana from harming him um, because if Diana takes out um, Pedro Pascal or Ma Maxwell then Barbara is going to get uh, reverted as well Steve convinces Diana to let go of him and renounce her wish regaining her strength uh, which regains her strength um, let me see she returns home and dons the armor of the legendary Amazon warrior Asteria, then heads to the broadcast station and battles Barbara, who has been transformed into a being of pure rage after wishing to become an apex predator. So, turns into a big CGI fest. Uh, we get Wonder Woman in her, I, I guess, like... Uh, level two gear i don't remember uh she must have got a, she got an upgrade or something did we see her return home i don't remember seeing her return home. i, I might have pulled out my phone for two seconds and missed her going but i swear she was flying and then all of a sudden she just she comes out of the air and you know she we don't see her change i mean you don't have to see her change but i was like i don't remember seeing her return home I do remember her talking about it but like it's like okay so yeah, strong, incredible two vibes when um we're getting this stuff with uh, Pedro Pascal trying to broadcast things, and we've seen movies before, you know, try to hack TVs and hack little um uh, cell phones and stuff like that. You know, hack the network so that they can broadcast their stupid messages and stuff like that. And listen, they're basically just trying to get their podcast so everyone can listen to them, you know, kind of like I'm going to have to do. Actually, maybe I should talk to Pedro Pascal and or Maxwell Lord and see how he, you know, hack the network so we can get the look at the podcast and everybody just listen to it all worldwide and then everybody be good. I think everybody would be golden, you know, they, all your wishes would come true or at least my wish would come true. So we'd be good. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, I will say the CGI fest with, uh, what is it? Uh, Cheetah and Wonder Woman. Not that interesting. It's kind of a forgettable and uninteresting place to fight. I didn't think the fight was that interesting. I didn't think that the, the place was that interesting. 
Um, it looked like she was fighting one of the members of Cats, like one of the, <laughs> like I I didn't know what to do with this third act, and so it it just kind of felt like an extension of the third act after after she defeats, um, uh, what's her face, uh, Barbara. Um, let me see. She she like shocks her with one of the uh, uh, wires that come out of the electrical system, and she's fine. Uh, it's she's like, I'm sorry, I had to do this. I thought she was gonna kill her. I was like, ooh, she's good. Barbara's good. And so, um, after defeating Barbara, Diana confronts Maxwell and uses her lasso of truth to communicate with the world through him, convincing everyone to renounce their wishes. So I'm curious this entire last little bit of the movie. This is where it kind of broke my brain. They also show, um, you know, visions. Uh, she shows Maxwell a vision of his son and we see like uh, flashbacks of Pedro uh, Maxwell's um, uh, upbringing and stuff like that. And I think it's supposed to like, you know, he was never loved. He was abused. His father hated him, that type of thing. A lot of things that kind of uh, resonate with Trump, actually. But um, yeah, with saying all that, I did feel something for this scene of... Um, Pedro Pascal just, you know, wanting this moment. He's such a, a dynamic actor, to be honest. And I think Patty Jenkins did sh shoot the hell out of the scene. And the editing, this is where the editing came in for me. I thought, you know, the, I was like, all right, now we're kind of getting some backstory. It was a little bit of a cheap backstory, but um, I think we got, what did we get? We We understood that the lasso could give us flashbacks through what Steve Trevor was showing us as well. So I think that's what we were understanding is that Wonder Woman was getting or, you know, receiving flashbacks through the lasso of truth um, from Maxwell. And so I really enjoyed the dynamic between, you know, the, the, the father, the son, him wanting to see us on uh, Alistair. Um, that's really well and dandy now telling people to renounce the wish this is where the problem comes in okay so just like tenant I, I i can talk about tenant a little bit without going to uh spoilers but if you've seen the trailer you know oh well, let's not talk about tenant but let's let's because uh, i don't i don't want to like compare the two i guess they're i guess they're both wb um but okay so if you've renounced the wish it shows two things does it stop the thing from happening or does it revert the thing from ever happening this was the big problem i had with this movie it shows missiles in the air clearly hold on okay so the the missile is in the air and people are saying okay it's exploding as if it stopped the wish but then there's other wishes it's showing like pollution or something like that at one point, reversing into the smokestack. And so it's showing some scenes in reverse. And so if you rev if you renounce the wish, are you reversing or are you just stopping it from happening? It's The movie is saying that it's both, and that just doesn't make sense to me. Because, um, it you know, we see uh, Maxwell run outside and all this stuff is... Um, you know, flying everywhere. There's debris everywhere. It's um, clearly the world has changed despite the wishes being reversed. But what what is the, I guess, what is the logic? And it just makes, it just opens this Pandora, Pandora's box of like, wait a second, what the fuck just happened? And it's like, all right, I guess we'll just sweep that under the rug and not worry about it again <laughs> because it is not addressed. I don't feel like anybody wants to explain it. Um, you know, it, does it make sh uh, renouncing the wish? Does it make it never happen? Or, you know, d do people remember this? I, I guess I'm trying to remember if uh, I guess, I, my guess is people do remember it, but it's just like what, you know, the dude's there. If you think about it, 
there's probably a chunk of people that just went missing, like the leftover style, just like 2% of the world that just went missing or were turned into a dead guy that was reincarnated. Because if Wonder Woman did it, then all of these other people probably did it too. So it's just, you know, it's a temporary amount of time, but still, it's just like, what? There, There is so many things with saying, all right, there's wishes granted on a global scale and it's transferred through the broadcast system. It's like, Oh my goodness. And what are the fu- it felt just like what are the fucking odds that there is a giant broadcasting system that can um you know go through the entire government or something like that and hack everyone's network kind of thing. It's just like really that y- y'all just going to leave it right there for them. It's like ugh. all right. So um yeah, it, it's just like asking the monkey to pick up the machine gun and do something stupid. It's just like why would you leave the machine gun right there or why would you right the machine gun right there. there there's no there was nothing hard for these characters to do it felt like just it all laid at their feet it was given to them very easily this this movie feels like it's just giving you the exposition and they're just going along kind of like this ex escapade and i did get a little bit of this like indiana jones feeling a little bit with them like traveling internationally but um like overall it just felt like there was no detective work really needed in this it just like all kind of happened and so continuing on just finishing up uh wandering the street uh sorry wonder woman shows maxwell a vision of his son alistair wandering the street as chaos ensues as uh from his fulfillment of everyone's desires maxwell renounces his wish and returns home to reunite with his son averting global thermonuclear war um Barbara, having refused to renounce her own wish, is stripped of her cheetah powers. Um, sometime later, Diana meets the man who, whose uh, body Steve was inhabiting while she continues to protect the world. Um, ultimately, Asteria is revealed to be alive and living among humanity in secret, much like Diana. Um, and Asteria, I believe, was she in the first movie as well? I'm I'm trying to remember if played in Max Payne. I don't know. I think she was in the uh, the original one as well. Sorry, I know she was in the original Wonder Woman. Um, what was she was Wonder Woman seventy five through seventy nine, but I'm trying to figure out if she was. Wonder Woman in 2017, a possible sequel to, uh, uh, I don't think she was in Wonder Woman, let me see, asked me to do a cameo, she was out of the concerts, I think, okay, so she was asked to be in the first Wonder Woman, but she was doing stuff, but, um, next time, I think that's what, what it was, so, um, I guess there's multiple Wonder Woman, is that what I'm, is that what I'm, uh, now uh, there's just so many questions I have after all of these just Pandora's box of uh, just everything just explodes at the end of this just with the wishes and the broadcast system and the and the Pedro Pascal of it all I was just like all right this is this is getting out of hand and this is where I, you, you're losing me movie um, despite I did have some there were some like endearing moments um, with uh, uh, I think Pascal and his son were the most endearing in this movie, although I did feel a little bit more... Um, I felt a little something between Diana and Steve Trevor when they were finally leaving, although the majority of the time, to be honest, I do not feel like they have great... Um, they they have odd chemistry, in my my opinion. They have, like, buddy chemistry. I don't know if anyone else feels that. They're just so good looking of people that there's like two forces that just don't combine together. They're like uh, oil and vinegar, in my opinion. I mean, I'm sure there's a chunk of people. I, I, I'm not trying to put those people away. You know, there's a subsect of people that are like, how can you not see Chris Pan and Gal Gadot? Oh my goodness, the babies they would make. It's like, obviously, they would make gorgeous, gorgeous human beings. Not going to say that. Otherwise, I, I don't know if they're married or not, but um, I'm, I just feel like the chemistry is a little bit odd. 
except for that very last scene. That very last scene, I felt like I was uh, I was watching a full on Hallmark, uh, Hallmark movie, and I was I was dead in it. I was balls deep. I was I was like I was feeling it. I was like, do you do? No, I swear to God, I'll change. I swear I'll do it again. <laughs> it was just like, just like, uh, I don't know how to really describe it. Um, their chemistry is hit or miss for me, and I think it's in the writing. I'm not really sure exactly what it is, though. So, yeah, this movie was all over the fucking place, to be honest. Um, and it just did not hit on the same cylinders that the, uh, uh, original Wonder Woman did in 2017. The original Wonder Woman in 2017 had this vibe and this pacing about it that felt like we were going on a journey. This feels much, uh, some people would say more like a hangout movie, but it's, it's like a, a it's a combination of things, you know, it was, uh, monkey's paw versus fish out of water. It's a reverse fish out of water for uh, Steve Trevor, but ultimately that character just doesn't seem to serve Wonder Woman in the ways that I think this movie needed him to. I, I Everybody loved their chemistry in the first one, and I think I did too, but um, I gotta say their um, reasoning to get back together and then what they did with it after this was just kind of like, alright, let's go on more dates. Let's go on. It felt like, uh, it's like, alright, we're gonna have the viewers going on a, a vicarious date with uh, Chris Pine and um, Diane, Diane. I just did I say Diane Lane earlier? Diane, Diana. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris Pine and Diana. And at certain parts, I felt like I was watching like an HGTV like special. I was like, all right, this is the the problematic stuff in this is just so much less tense. And I guess I was just. Um, you know, if it's going to be fun and whimsical, it's got to be shorter, to be honest. And at two hours and 20 minutes, it ain't it, son. So thank you for listening, watching Look It All podcast, the Wonder Woman 1984 review. Um, let me know how I can improve this podcast next time. I'll try to not record it at five in the morning, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And, um, yeah, just like the lasso of truth, I'm going to um, whip it and, whoosh, and get on out. Take it easy. Remember to rate, share, subscribe. Look at our podcast. The only way we can do this is if you grow. You gotta grow this shit. You gotta grow it. You gotta plant it. You gotta put the water. You gotta put the. You gotta put the flavorings. You gotta put the spices. You gotta put the sauces. You gotta put the flavorings. You gotta put the marinade, and then you're good to go. So, um, yeah, uh, get this podcast live on Twitch. Get it early on YouTube, Patreon. Get it mastered on SoundCloud. And we talked about Linda Carter showing up at the end of this, like, uh. That that was it was it was a cool cool little cameo. I I think I did say that I have no idea what this means for the universe, and I forgot if she wasn't in the first one. So, um, I guess she's just an Amazonian. Amazonian, um, yeah, got a lot of questions. All right, well, now now I'm just gonna sit here and think about that. Thanks, thanks for listening, watching, lucky dog podcast. Take it easy.